Hello and welcome to Spirit Pig. This is the show that explores how to live a fulfilled life. I'm Duncan CJ and today I'm speaking with America's leading relationship experts, Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt. Harville and Helen are the authors of 10 relationship books, including three New York Times bestsellers, and have been published in over 57 languages. Harville is a couples therapist with more than 40 years experience as an educator, clinical trainer and lecturer whose work has appeared on Oprah 17 times. Oprah described his book, Getting the Love You Want, as the best relationship book ever. Helen, in addition to her partnership in the authorship of 10 books on relationships and her co-creation of Imago Relationship Theory and Therapy, is the sole author of Faith and Feminism and has been installed in the Women's Hall of Fame for her leadership in the global women's movement. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. We're delighted. And we were just saying before I click record, I think this is um, it's going to be a really fun one. I was just when researching your work and hearing your stuff it's so many things were complete brand new learnings for myself and so i love to yeah like jump in with a couple of these things um one of them i loved i love you kind of described how i kind of painted this picture how you know we're in a room it might be a crowded room and we suddenly see somebody from across the room and we're drawn to them like a like a moth to flame and we feel <laughs> these amazing things you know we call it romantic love they're our dream person we have this whole story behind it yeah. And actually, what's interesting, and what, what I mean, I didn't realize, and I think most of us didn't realize, is actually there's a program running in the background subconsciously, you know, th- that is matching us with someone similar to our parents or primary caretakers. I'm sure yes. people are going to hear that and think, what? My parents? No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> yes, it is. Um, a moment of nausea. <laughs> a, mo- a moment of nausea. It's, it's the... Uh, it's the information nobody wants to know is <laughs> that, that when you um, see somebody across the crowded room, that you're looking at them with two pairs of eyes. And one is uh, what you're seeing physically and what you're experiencing. But you're also looking at them with another pair of eyes that Sigmund Freud sort of identified actually more than 100 years ago that we have, you know, we have two sets of perception. And one is we're aware of and the other one we're not aware of. But the one we're not aware of is what's feeding the feelings that we are aware of. And the feeling is I see you across the crowded room and I have this intense emotional reaction. My conscious mind thinks it's because you're so beautiful or so handsome or so great and be a good partner. Your unconscious mind says, ah, source of need satisfaction not met since childhood looks like my parents. Now I'm finally going to get it. So you move across the crowded room with an open bucket saying, you know, fill me up. And um, when you become conscious of that, you're aware the person you fell in love with is the person who's least capable of filling up your filling up your bucket because um, they are similar to the people with whom you wound up with an empty bucket. And we're so. Yeah. So so these are so we're 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 matching particularly we're talking about that empty bucket. We're, We're matching with a person with whom. I think you said we'll experience the worst frustrations that we had as a child, like with our caregiver, like the things that were the biggest pain points, the things that were biggest um, frustrations, pains. That's what we're matching. That's right. <clears throat> right. In, in memory and in interaction with the caretakers, you set up, you, you acquire certain memories. And some of the memories are everything was good. You know, mom fed me on time. Dad hugged me or a kind tone of voice. Uh, Those memories are not very emotionally charged. It's interesting that positive memories have low emotional charge. Negative memories have a high emotional charge because the negative memory means a need didn't get met. And and this need was essential. It wasn't for the baby. all, All needs are essential. So it's not like this was an option. But that charge of a need not met means that there's a memory of that need not being met, which I have to get met in order to survive. So in adulthood, when you go across the crowded room, your mind unconsciously is attracted to a person similar to the caretaker with whom the need didn't get met. And then at the unconscious level, there is, uh, you have to get the need met from the person who was supposed to meet it, which is your caretaker. And so you pick a simile. We call it a reasonable facsimile of the caretaker at the unconscious level. So then you move into to a partnership. You become a couple. You now say, here's my bucket. 
Um, you don't say it outright, you know, I picked you because you're like my mother, but you unconsciously are operating that way. And so you say, okay, hug me. Uh, and this person says, well, you know, I don't do hugs. Well, that's what your caretakers did in childhood. They didn't hug. So you need a hug, but you're married a non-hugger. And so you're going to be as frustrated in the relationship as you were as a child. But that's not the, and I think Helen uh, can respond. That's all that means is here's the opportunity for optimal growth. Yeah. It happens when the polarity of need deficits (laughs) match each other. So Helen. So basically we're here to dispel a myth that's out in the culture that if you're having trouble in your relationship, uh, you, you're with the wrong person. Sure. Like sure. you screwed up. The guys, <laughs> the person's a jerk. You know, they seemed so great at one time and you know, they must've tricked you, but now you see who they really are. So, yep. and we're, and we're, we're here to dispel that myth that struggling means something's bad because actually we say uh, conflict is growth trying to happen because you pick that person in your life for a reason. So we invite couples to get curious about what the struggle is really about and for and to allow the transformation to happen. That's the exciting moment when you're in conflict because the transformation is trying to occur in your partner, in you, uh, in the relationship. And I, I say maybe God's trying to show up. <laughs> so, well, so well then suddenly thinking, oh no, like we're incompatible we can that's a whole different mindset when we flip it in our head and think hey this is an opportunity for mutual healing and growth then i guess it just that that change of mindset changes our whole perception and the way we look at the relationship like rather than thinking oh sc- damn it i've, I've screwed up yeah. <laughs> another one yeah must not again many- same pattern same yeah, again again I wonder why. <laughs> well, and many, many people, the, the problem of serial relationships is that many people do say that. And that's why Helen is so intense on saying, you know, conflict is growth trying to happen. Mm. And that if you didn't have this, and what that basically means is everybody's unconscious sets them up with a polarity. And that polarity is incompatible. They are not compatible with this other person. But that's the way the unconscious sets up the tension of the opposites so that that tension produces growth. But if it turns into conflict, then it produces separation. And then you go look for somebody else with whom to do that again. It's conflict, got to go. Conflict, got to go. No, the conflict is the trigger of the potential that's in this relationship. And, and we, say, we say incompatibility is grounds for a great relationship. Exactly. That's a total but paradigm you have to, shift. It's a total you have, flipping on the head what the common narrative is. But you just have to know how to handle the difference. And that's our lane in the bowling alley. We know how to help a couple shift from conflict to connection. Yeah. I guess what's interesting, talking about the um, activating those parts that need growth. I mean, I guess it's not just, um, you know, any pain points or any bits of growth. I mean, it will be activate the exact part which needs the most growth. It's your it's your Achilles heels, which are these are bits are going to be the bits that are firing, aren't they? Right. Yes. Uh, it yeah. sounds like you know about this. I mean, I'm 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 I'm, I'm looking at your work and I'm like, oh, it makes sense. I'm starting to put the pieces together. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that uh, shall I comment on that the the precision. That's the thing that also startled us as we got into this work is that it's not just something in general, like I need to grow. It's like I need to grow at a particular point and in a particular way. And it's the point of the greatest conflict. This person is triggering uh, me reacting negatively at the point of my deepest need to grow. And I give you an example. It's okay if I give an example about feelings. So, when I was uh, <clears throat> when I was little, um, one of the things I grew up on a farm, and one of the uh, useless things on a farm is feelings. Uh, on a farm, what's useful is work, and that if something bad happens, you just deal with it and go on. And we don't have time for you to cry. We don't have time for you to you know be sad. We you you have to get back to it. So I grew up uh, with the with my feelings uh, sort of um, tampered down. 
and held in a cage. So the feelings were, were not that. So Helen grows up in a family where she doesn't get feelings expression and she comes to adulthood and a part of her wants emotional connection. And what I'm able to offer is cognitive and behavioral connection. Like I can send you flowers, I can take you to dinner, I can tell you I love you, but she was needing me to have affect when I talked to her about my feelings for her. And it was like, I don't do emotions, I do <laughs> behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> here we go, said, here we I, go. I have two windows. <laughs> I, I sent you flowers and I sent you a card and I took you to Paris. And you know, you don't get it. I love you. And she says, I'm not feeling your feeling your love for me. And I was like, what in the world is this woman talking about? Um, because it was behavioral love. That's what I got as a childhood. They fed me, they clothed me, they housed me, they sent me to school. And so we didn't do a lot of hugging. But here I marry somebody who wants all that. And so she comes to me to get it. And I'm the least capable of giving it. But since it's a part of me, I shut it down in childhood to survive. She's asking me to grow at the point of my deepest need to grow, which is to activate and integrate my own emotions. So she calls into being the undeveloped part of me. And as I begin to practice paying attention to what's happening inside, feeling it, pushing it out. I discover, wow, feeling is, I can feel. And fe <laughs> feeling is wonderful. It's great to feel something, to be able to cry in a movie, be able to cry at a funeral, uh, to cry with my children's, you know, I'm right with my children's excitement, to, to, to cry with her pleasures and joys. I couldn't do that. And, and I wouldn't have. She was like, Feelings, that's the growth <laughs> point. So I grow there and that's the biggest part of me. Now, and what I've found is that as I've integrated feelings into my life, I've, I have always been cognitively active and a thinker. But as I put feelings into my life, I'm way more creative. So that what Helen brings to my relationship is the recovery of my feelings and the triggering of my creativity, which is why we're doing this Imago system. I mean, we are creating that because now I have uh, ability to access data that doesn't come through the logical mind, it comes through the emotional mind. Helen is full of that. She's just full of, uh, she's very intelligent. She's full of information and ideas. And so I benefit from her emotionality in ways that I could not have ever planned. So God set you up to have the worst pain possible in the service of the greatest growth mm. possible with this person. And it's like, I don't like the theory either. Yeah. And the reason we know it's true is because <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> it's, it, it ought to be that you marry somebody who, who is very different from all the childhood caretakers, who meets all those needs without your having to experience the conflict and connection. But it's just not the case because both, both people activate the, the things in each other that they need to grow the most. So anyway, it is a fascinating thing. It took us about what, 10 years to figure that out, working with couples, listening to them, and finally it dawns on us that uh, the, <laughs> the first time it dawned on us about incompatibility, my, our, my, rea my reaction was depression. I said, I'm out of this business. I'm not going to work in a business where everybody fails. <laughs> you know, okay, and because marriages were not solvable. You couldn't negotiate out of that. You can't compromise out of that. You can't do problem solving out of that. Um, and, you know, those were the ways that people were working with marriages is like come up with a good contract. You do A and you do B and you'll be happy. Nobody was ever happy because they weren't getting the core emotional need net. And so I said to Helen, I'm out. And then one day it dawned on us that, hey, that impasse is where the growth is. That's not the failure. That's where the potential lies. And so, you know, we've been in conversation about this since 1977. So it's like I have this intellectual partner who says, yes, that makes sense. And then she begins to unload about how all that looks. So it's been a fun journey <laughs> to figure out that one point. And then everything else then follows from that, because once you know that the polarity is the place where the great potential is, 
then you can't just know that. Psychotherapy helps you know a lot of things without helping you do something. So I think the thing we brought to that is that we now know how to help you uh, resolve that impasse of incompatibility. That's not going to go away. That's your growth potential. We can help you optimize the tension there so that you can now grow into a relationship you couldn't have without the polarity. We know how to help you do that. And we have done that now very successfully in 37 countries. So we are uh, pretty pleased with that. So Helen, you you want to add to that? I want to hear from you. Well, I was going to say, so I mean, like, I guess, once again, that's a different mindset in the sense that rather than us all thinking we're these whole perfect people to almost recognize that we are all a bit broken and just to accept that. And then it's about this, you know, it's about that kind of growth when we actually recognize that we're kind of, we, we're all, we're all wounded to a certain degree. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, that, yes. And I think the research on that is pretty indicative that probably <clears throat> at the last time I saw it was about 10 to 14% of the people in and this was in the Western world, actually had fairly healthy childhoods. And so the rest of us didn't. And it was from, you know, uh, minor to mild to severe, but that everybody, just about everybody's walking around with a, a with a relational rupture from childhood and they're trying to get it repaired. And uh, you're mentioning the wound. Was it, is it Leonard Cohen, the musician? Yeah. That that's, that's where the light comes in. Is oh, wow. the wound that it's where we're oh, broken? Right. It's where we're broken that the that the transformation, the beauty, can come if you know how to hold it. If you don't run from it, but know how to hold it, and we and we know how to do that. We know how to teach a couple how to hold that moment and make the transformation happen. I love that. I love that. That, that reminded me of. Um, uh, I got really into um, learned about a couple of months ago about this concept of. Um, uh, I think it's Japanese, uh, wabi-sabi, where you might have like a vase and it might be cracked. And so rather than try and pretend that crack's not there, like yeah. they, they shine a spotlight on that crack and then they, they gild right. it in like gold. And so we're, we are, we're all broken. We're all imperfect, you know, but actually to celebrate that. And I, I thought that was such a beautiful, beautiful way. <laughs> um, so you, you found that couples are incompatible in two basic ways one like how they relate to structure versus freedom and then the other one how we handle stress and conflict can you maybe give some examples of either of those sure. so in our community um we talk about uh everyone responds to what we didn't get in you know from our parents mm. like it's pain they were either intrusive controlling us or or they neglected us and in response to that uh people either minimize their feelings they draw in because it's so painful and process them or they maximize their feelings and they they have to say hey i don't like this and they tell everyone and they talk about it and we call these two types um that someone who minimizes is a turtle and someone who maximizes their feelings is a hailstorm and every turtle falls in love with that energy of the hailstorm they're so excited that someone can hail a just effervesce. And every hailstorm inevitably ends up with a turtle who, like, yeah, you know, they need someone who can find the car keys <laughs> or fix the boiler or, yeah, you know, someone's got to stay grounded. And so, but so we really teach a couple that when, especially when a conflict arises, one of you will minimize your feelings and process within, and one of you will maximize your feelings and go, what are we going to do? Oh, wait, I've got, oh, I think we need help. We need some, a consultant to come in. <laughs> and the other one says, there's no big deal. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they have to know that's normal, yeah. that nature is dyadic. Everything, black, white, up, down, in, out, yin, yang. Like there's the yin and yang is an Even eternal the double helix. And it's the, yes, and everything is dyadic, and your partnership is dyadic, and one of you is gonna uh, contain while the others. But then, then we teach a couple, the expressive one, the hailstorm. The more that person hails on their turtle, the more the turtle's gonna withdraw into the shell. 
So the hailstorm has to learn and that we tell the hailstorm what they have to do to get patient and wait for the turtle to be available. And the turtle needs to sometimes push themselves to come out and ask the hailstorm if they need something. And anyway, and express they, them, they, they, <laughs> they regulate each. I mean, they yeah, influence each other's right. dynamic. Yeah. And so it's very empowering mm. that mm. once I learned that Harville just needed time, I just found a hobby that I love doing. You don't point. take it so personally, I guess, because, you know, when, when, you know, say a turtle is in their shell, rather yeah. than thinking, oh, no, like you're, you're trying to fix it or you make it better or you're taking it hugely personal. You're like, OK, you know each other's like archetypes, you know each other's patterns. And then so you can allow them the time or the, the space to yeah. come out of the shell. Yeah, well, you said that really nicely. It's also how dare they? <laughs> I mean, especially him. Yeah. Like he's a turtle. Yeah. yeah. I'm the hailstorm. And I wanted to talk yeah. about my worries about things. And he would go in his shell and go, hey, you're a relationship expert. You're, you're, you're supposed to talk. And he'd go, I don't want to talk to you. i go, I need you to talk to me. I, go, I don't want to. So. <laughs> so we had to learn how to so, talk. So I started needle <laughs> so pointing. So we could talk. I started doing needle pointing. And I have, I, I've just made incredible tapestries waiting for my turtle when, it was, <laughs> when he was available. Because he needed time to uh, process his feelings. And he was so grateful. Once I waited, so I know to wait. And he's learned some things that helps me when I need to heal. Yeah. He helps yeah. me stop healing. <laughs> and I think our phrase for it is you accept otherness. The other is not you. They're never going to be you. But all of us want the other to be like us. You know, be, why don't you be more logical and rational? Then we wouldn't have all these problems. And she says, why don't you be more emotional? And then life would be more exciting. Well, we're not that. So we accept each other. And then the energy moves out of conflict into connecting and mm -hmm. co-creating. And that's a total transformation of energy when you move it away from polarizing to connecting. Yeah. And because it's only in connecting that you can actually uh, grow in and meet the deepest human need, which is to experience being with another person without criticism and without negative energy. So you have to move through the negative energy to create a new space. And that requires what we have developed is a, a way to talk that couples don't know how to talk. For hardly anybody knows how to talk without polarizing, because I usually think the world is the way I see it. But it happens to be also the way you see it. But you, your view is wrong. A mind is right. And so it's like. So we have to learn how to talk so that we hold each other's separate realities, uh, understand them, accept them and hold them. And actually we use the word advocate for your difference, advocate for your otherness, so that we advocate for you to be who you truly are with me, even sometimes if it's at my discomfort, because my discomfort simply means I have difficulty accepting difference. But once I fully accept difference, then I don't have discomfort. I have a uh, celebration for who you are and that I get to live with you. And that's a very different world than the, than the struggle uh, about who's going to run this show. And, and that, that acceptance, I guess, comes hand in hand with this theme and this idea of safety. You've got to create yes. a feeling of safety, a feeling of trust and Without, without that safety, then nothing can happen. Like, there's basically steps three, four, whatever, just ignore them because without the safety first, like everything else is, 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 is never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You got that. And I'm, I, I can see you, you did your research is that, that that's the, that's the platform of the human situation. If it's not safe, it's dangerous. And if it's dangerous, I'm going to protect myself and we can't connect through defenses and we'll only be defensive if we feel scared. So we have to get to safety, then we can drop our defenses, and now we can move toward connecting and holding. And so that's absolutely right. Safety is non-negotiable. There's a guy who's been, his name, we, we like to use his name because we want him to be known. His name is uh, Stephen Porges, uh, whom you might have on sometime, who spent 30 years in a lab studying one nerve, one nervous system called the vagal nerve. And this vagal system, uh, he discovered, 
the short version of it is it's the part of your whole uh, neurology that registers whether or not your environment is safe or dangerous. And if it's dangerous, you're out of control. Your brain cannot do anything because the vagal nerve is going to say danger and all the armament of your being will click on. It's just like a, it's just like if somebody said the Russians are firing, you know, they, they may threaten us. Every silo missile in the, our country will go on alert and it won't shut down until there's no threat and you can't shut it down with you. You can't say, oh, there's no threat here. Your vagal nerve knows when the threat goes away, then it'll turn off automatically. So you're not in charge, according to him. He spent 30 years in this. And so what, what we discovered was that he established the neurophysiological basis of the, uh, our posit about safety being non-negotiable in relationships. Now we know why it is so non-negotiable. It's that you don't connect without it. <laughs> and it's your body in your body and your mind are going to um, shut down and or defend yourself if you don't have it. So you don't have a choice. If you want a great relationship, it has to be safe. And that means you have to give up judgment and criticism. And you have to go to affirmation and holding and positive energy and all the things that the brain says, oh, this is safe when we're laughing. It's safe when we're having fun. It's safe when we're you know, look in each other's eyes and our eyes are relaxed. It's safe when I see Helen smile, but if the eyes go hard, the cheeks go up, um, and the smile isn't there, the brain says not safe. Um, and you don't even know why your feelings change, but your vagal system just went, oh, That's not safe. Yeah. Because I've heard of so, I've heard of like the part of the brain which is about fight or flight, but I don't know but I didn't know about the vagal nerve. So that's that's really really interesting. And that's the nerve that regulates all that. What he added to it was there's fight, flight, and freeze. <clears throat> and some of us, I'm, I'm a turtle. I know about freezing. Um, I try to, as a turtle, I try to get away if it's conflictual. Uh, and if not, I'll fight with you. But if it looks like I'm not going to win, I just go into, well, frozen position. And I'm immobile, immovable. And that used to be what I would be around Helen many, many years ago, breathes in order to feel safe. And when animals, he discovered, Ford just discovered that when animals go into the freeze mode, uh, that's in order for the predator to think they're dead. Yeah, it's like, it's like when the cat grabs a mouse in its mouth, the mouse will just play, it'll, it'll act like it's dead. Uh, or it'll, its system will actually shut down. And, be, and then the cat won't eat it. It's totally automatic. You can't, you can't help yourself. Except you can, we do a lot of brain stuff in our work with couples. And uh, uh, everyone should write down uh, this if you don't know it. You can't control your first thought, but you can control your second and your third and your fourth. And the sooner you can move to your upper brain, uh, uh, you'll get free from this this uh, reactive uh, fight or flight freeze, which is um, pushes your partner away. Uh, and why we have a structured conversation and that safe conversations is a three-step process and the Mago dialogue is a three-step process is you have to move to the upper brain to do the sentence stems. And if your partner has caused you to react about something and you want to sock them in the jaw, uh, or, or adios, yeah, I, I, it's, it's my way or the highway and I'm getting on the highway. Like, well, the first thing you do is you stop and you mirror back what they just said and say, let me see if I got it <laughs> instead of running or hitting them go, let me see if I got it. I think I heard you say, <clears throat> and you mirror and then you validate and you empathize. You don't agree with them, but this structured but conversation you puts you in the part of your brain where your lower brain calms down. It's like a virus, a red alert goes off. And so when you're in your upper brain, this all calms down. <laughs> then And then you're in the part of your brain that can create win-wins, mm -hmm. uh, a collaboration a you know, where we can both get our way. But when you're down here and this alarm has gone off, forget it. 
if you don't move yourself. So you can't change your first thought, but you can change your second, third, and fourth and co-create the solution to that problem and also the relationship of your dreams. Yeah. Like the, the mouse might not have a dialogue with the cat, uh, you know, because the cat's not interested. But, <laughs> but in human beings, when the freeze or any of the other defenses happen, what, what Helen just described is you do have a choice to move toward each other and restore safety. And we do that through the dialogue process. One of um, you mentioned earlier um, the word connection, and obviously that is pretty paramount in so much of this. I think you're talking about one of the fundamental things that you've come to understand is that human beings are hungry. And so we'll eat anything that satisfies that hunger. And so some people, we might look for that in food, relationships, um, work, whatever, but we, we kind of are trying to get that hunger for connection. What, what's, what's that all about? Well, so I sort of set that up. And so we, uh, what, what it's all about is a big concept, which it's in our view, uh, we have Imago is an intellectual system that is rooted in a uh, in philosophy and the branch of philosophy called ontology, which is about what is being, what is re- or what is reality. What if you if you couldn't if you if you're at the bottom concept, what's what's and there's nothing beyond this concept. Being is this, and we say being is connecting. That that's what the whole universe is doing. Every brain cell is connected. The axon is connecting with the neuron. Uh, human beings are trying to connect with each other. The double helix, uh, there's a connecting energy that uh, goes back and forth across the two strands of the double helix. Uh, all the stars, all, uh, the planets, the moons revolving around each other, the rotation. It's yeah. the sun, <clears throat> the galaxy. It's a choreographer dance up there everything is connecting in just the right way yeah and see in in classical physics uh uh, newton said that the universe is made up of uh, atoms and they uh and but they're just wandering around in the universe and quantum mechanics came along about in the late 19th century early 20th century and said well newton was right about the atoms and but what he didn't know was that underneath the atom there's uh, something else called a particle but also what he didn't know he thought they were all disconnected that they were just banging into each other and randomly formed things but quantum physics says everything that newton said is right except that everything is connected every atom is connected to every other atom every molecule is connected to every molecule Every galaxy is connected to other galaxies, but also we're connected to the galaxies. There is interconnectivity is the defining adjective of the whole cosmos. And we are the cosmos. You know, we are a piece of the cosmos. So therefore, we mirror and hold in us what is true of the whole universe. So connecting is not just a social wish. It is what we are. And when we are not feeling that, not experiencing that, we're not aware of that because we're scared. When you're scared, you can't feel connecting. When you're scared, you feel isolated and defended. So what we really want is what we are. We want to experience our being and our being is connecting and it's connecting with something. It's not a a spiritual idea. It's not something you can just imagine. It has to happen. It has to be. So our mind and Helen's relationship is a conduit through experiencing ourselves being a part of the cosmos. And when we're in conflict, I can't experience her. I'm only experiencing my defenses. I can't feel the cosmos either. So I feel then isolated and alone in the universe. And so when we get back together and we reconnect, then my awareness is that I'm not only experiencing being with Helen, but I am a part of a connecting universe. And that's wondrous. And then when I feel that, I feel fully alive. That's being. Being is connecting. The felt sense of connecting is full aliveness. So what Helen and I said, well, that's a big concept. How do you deal with it at the micro level, the the split between her and me when we're scared? Well, that's what we came up with. You have to have, you have to create safety. 
so that your defenses relax and you can experience the wholeness of being. Well, safety is created basically through conversation. The use of words, human beings, uh, I mean, all mammals have languages, but they just don't have words. They have sounds, movements, and so forth. But human beings have all of that, but they also have language. And language is the major conduit of meaning. So if I say to Helen, you know, that, that didn't look right. Um, well, that her, her brain already goes right with that. She had a little bit of cortisol. But if I say, that is beautiful, that's really wonderful, I've just produced some endorphin in her brain and she can't, I can, I can control her chemistry and, it and is, she can it, control my it, chemistry and it is the words, with language, but also the way you looked at me and then the look and the tone of voice right. and the body language. So we do tell couples that it's, yeah. it's, uh, and, and certain behaviors, but the words are the big thing. Yeah. Like I can say, I love you <laughs> and that doesn't do it. <laughs> <clears throat> and like so you can defend old, that. Yeah. <laughs> so day, what? In the old yeah. days, I would say to Helen, I love you, but I had no affect. Yeah. But what the brain needs is the felt sense of what really is there. So that's why we focus on connecting, that it is, it becomes a social experience in relationship, but that's rooted in a cosmic reality. <clears throat> and through the social, we experience the cosmos. I get to be married to him. <laughs> Well, I get to make up amazing stories, <laughs> but I like, I like this theory. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with it. But the link, yeah, I mean, it, it totally makes sense. Like when you've got that connection, everything kind of flows, everything, you know, the link between that and just your general sense of like, just even outside the relationships, just your general sense of like well being when you feel a part of something bigger, as opposed to feeling isolated when, you know, things aren't working, things like not really flowing. So, um, it, may, it makes total sense. And look at your shirt. Like, yeah. there, you, there, look at that. Look at all those colors. I know. It's, it's fun, isn't it? It's, it's, I wear this one way too much. I think, like, literally, like, some people, like, just get a new shirt. I, th I think I'm probably about five items of clothing. Right. I should rotate them. Orange. <laughs> yeah. Grays. Greens. Like, it's, like, vibrantly alive. And so that's what we do for the insides of people, hopefully. But not many people wear that many colors. <laughs> I don't think we've ever been interviewed by anyone that colorful. Oh, well, that's fantastic. <laughs> I've, even, I've, got, I've got a green hat here. I can really go, I can go, yeah. for, I can go okay. without. Okay, and, and I'll tell you five. That is really colorful. Yeah. Uh, we just turned in to the publisher our next book. And, um, and Harville reminded us as we were writing it of Wordsworth's quote, we come to life trailing clouds of glory from which we come. And this book is about the technicolor world that we had at our birth and the wonder and the feeling of joy if when we were little. And we saw life with technicolor beauty. And I'm doing the graphics of the book. So that's why we got to take a picture of you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. but, but we lose it. Okay. it goes, <laughs> but we lose it and everything is black and white and gray uh. and it's dull <laughs> but we can recover the yeah. the technicolor world and it's in relationship it's not in the job it's not an achievement it's not in your kid's success all those are spurious um temporary mm -hmm. wonderful things but the real the best feeling in the world is is the connecting with that with the one special person in your life and I think connecting with the human problem, it dawned on us that addictions of all sorts are substitute attempts to experience um, connecting. You know, you take cocaine mm. or alcohol or you eat. Or That's, affairs. You're, you're trying to make, yeah, or affairs. Affair. Uh, you're trying to, you're trying to make, you're trying to move to a different state of being. And what we discovered is if you ask people, what are they ultimately trying to do? is that they're trying to feel alive and and but they want to feel alive by you know playing but you can't feel alive fully alive unless you are in a safe relationship you can feel aliveness by running on the beach or by climbing a tree or drinking or whatever aliveness is one thing uh even being anxious is being alive but full aliveness the totality of experiencing 
comes only in is a social experience and it comes only when you're with another who is significant to you and you're safe with that person. It is like the baby in the beginning of life with the caretaker, the baby babies who are not disturbed when they're born. You know, we know that many babies are born in trauma, but if you come with a natural birth, there's a natural connecting with the caretaker. And if you look at babies and mothers or babies and fathers playing together, even when their babies have no language, there's a kind of glee, kind of a joy. And, but, but that's who we are. But something happens in that relationship with every child because parents don't know how to keep that going. Mm. They, they become interested in something else and don't know how to go back and keep the baby in the state of, of, of connecting. And so the connecting is ruptured and then it becomes a memory. But you remember you had it and you remember that you lost it and you want back what you lost, but you don't know how to get it back. So you cry, you know, and then the mother or father comes and now, but they come now and that may work uh, or you cry and they don't come. Uh, and then you cry some more and then you quit crying because it didn't get them. But you keep trying to get that connecting going again. But because we're all, you know, kind of um, have flaws as parents, it never really becomes uh, predictable and, and chronic. And so it goes underground and tries, shows up in adolescence. It shows up with your best friend. And then it shows up when you fall in love, when you're an adult. That experience of romantic love is the recovery of the original experience of connecting. And, but you fell in love with somebody with whom you lost it in childhood. They're very similar with the person you lost it in childhood, so you're gonna lose it again. And then the marriage or the committed partnership becomes a struggle to get it back without any technology about how to get it back. So the culture hasn't taught us yet how to do this. So Helen and I, that's our, that's our journey, is that we have discovered how to get it back. We know this works. We have, we have millions of people who are engaging in the, in, the, in the reconnecting process. And that when they get it back, they don't have any psychological problems anymore. All psychological problems are functions of disconnection. And they're resolved when you connect because the fundamental human yearning is to be with another person be and to experience being, which is only possible through a relation through a concrete relationship. Do you connect with the, with the whole of being? So when you go through this process, it's amazing that problems just who, which were created by disconnection go away when you're connected. So you don't have to do anything unless it's been so long that you actually have to learn or have some medicine to help you get over something. The chemistry is all distorted. And there's, you know, some things, but if you're not, haven't gotten into being medically ill as a result of the ruptured connection and anxiety, you can repair it um, easily with a conversation. This is what I think is so exciting about these times, you know, with the research and, you know, what, what we're finding out over the last 10, 15, 20 years and all the, you know, all the amazing experts and practitioners out there, you know, all this, th these things, what we, we thought you know, this is my lot, you know, I've got to just put up with this. We're kind of realizing that actually, like, we can change these things, you know, all the things you're talking about, you know, neuroplasticity, like all, all these, like, things, we actually realize, hey, like, if there's anything, any part of our life, which, you know, is not serving us, which is, you know, like, a hindrance, then there's, there's, there's things we can do. So I think it's a very exciting and empowering time we live in. Yes. Yeah. Um, we to typically people say, well, what is a relationship? And you'll say, well, it's two people, you know, who have some past interactions or whatever. And we go, actually, uh, we think a relationship is two people and the space between them. And health of the relationship does not depend on your partner's mental health or yours or, you know, how good they are at a relationship for you. It's a, but it's really safety in the between and if two people can learn to create safety in the between they can connect and we have a book oh, that's the book that's going to press it's real short it's a funny book 
And, and the title of the book is The Space Between. And it's, it's not about your partner. It's not about you. It's you all learning to have a ritual where you keep the sa- space between safe, like before going to bed each night, give each other three appreciations. I was going to ask you that you 14 years ago, you have implemented that practice. And I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful because yeah, I mean, we, we hear about gratitude journals. We hear about the importance of these appreciations. And I guess it's probably cliche. It's a bit of a, a the phrase that what you appreciate appreciates, but it's, it's so true. Like what we're focusing on and what we kind of put our energy right. behind. Actually, yeah. that's but what we see more of. Here's yes. another quote. What you focus on is what you get. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I know Harville, I could see the spinach between his teeth and I had to tell him, but believe me, I finally <laughs> realized he really wanted an advocate instead of a, a critic, yes. <laughs> someone who was trying to improve him all the time. So I decided no matter what other people would tell him if he has spinach between his teeth and he deserved to have me as, as a, a source of unconditional advocacy for him. And if if he needed to change his wardrobe, someone else could tell him or what <laughs> it, or his personality or whatever. And I just um, practiced acceptance, and he's practiced acceptance of me. And it's a, it's a, for couples who want who who think like this, they can talk about couplehood as a spiritual path. It's really practicing shifting from judgment to curiosity, judgment to curiosity and wonder wonder about your partner and said, I was a very accurate judge. I was right about my judgments of Har- Harville, but we had a terrible relationship. <laughs> so until I gave up judging him and uh, just became curious and wondering more about him, letting him talk. <laughs> See, the, the thing is, when you hear Helen say this, it's so simple to have a great relationship. You just move from judgment to curiosity and that moves you out of danger into safety and that moves you then into connecting and joy. But if you judge, you ruin all of that. And in the neuroscience. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's not like, I mean, we didn't make that up. We just discovered that this is the way it works. This is the way human beings work. And that left brain, you know, the critical thinking that you get promotions for, better grades at school, that's great. You can judge and assess, but it's in when you wonder about something and you're curious, you're put in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the brain. And the neuroscientists say tolerating ambiguity is a sign of the best human brain health. And when you're up here just wondering about your partner instead of judging them, all these neurochemicals of awe begin to course through your body. You know, if you can just let go of judging them and wonder about why it is they think the way they think or feel the way they do. If you practice wonder, Mm -hmm. then you, you begin to be bathed in the neurochemicals of awe and wonder. What a nice, what a nice note to end on. Last but not least, how can people find out more about you and your work? Where can we send them? Well, there are. Uh, I think our personal website is the closest one, HarvilleandHelen.com, and we have then a professional website, two professional websites. If people want Imago therapists, if they would like to connect with our world community, it's ImagoRelationships.org. And our social action movement is relationshipsfirst.org. So there are three portals. I will put them all in the show notes. And Harvo and Helen, thank you so, so much for speaking with me today. It's been eye-opening, fascinating. I've now got, I'm now equipped with an arsenal of information to take into my next relationship. So we're ready to go. (laughs) Any prayers, hang in there. We did, and it it happened one day. Yeah. (laughs) The light came through, so it will do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're an amazing interviewer. This was a sheer pleasure to interact with you and your energy and your intelligence and emotions. So thank you.